Hi, everybody. Okay. Um, this presentation is on research undertaken by three academics from the discipline of media studies. So media studies is a subject of study that holds a strange place in the imagination of policymakers, politicians, the general public, and indeed often other academics. It is a subject people make jokes about in popular press or deride in soap operas and chat shows. Imagined as sometimes easy or non-academic, sometimes even called a Mickey Mouse degree. The research offered here makes it clear that media studies is no easy subject, but one requires knowledge of many different areas, sociology, psychology, <laughs> history, communication theory, and so on. And it is in no respect irrelevant to serious thinking in terms of understanding the crisis we find ourselves in, in terms of the mental health and well-being of our young people. It is worth remembering that media studies is a humanities subject. That is, it concerns itself with understanding human behaviour. Why do humans treat each other in the way that they do? It poses crucial questions about the source of many inequalities that make up our modern world and the role we might all have in creating a more positive, equal and respectful society. The increase in issues of mental health for young people as the statistics or evidence-based research has identified is one that appears to be connected with their use of social media platforms. And some of this research tends to see social media as reflecting problems that are already we already have in our culture or society. Media studies comes to this question perhaps the other way around, because media studies looks at the modern media as the most powerful medium by which we learn to become human. It does not regard the media as a reflection of human behaviour, but rather as a crucial, crucial site for the creation of ideas about how we should treat other people and also how we treat ourselves. My two colleagues and I are joined in our interest in the impact modern popular media is having on young people from a gendered perspective. How might what we see on the ground in terms of young people's behaviour be linked to how they are learning to become men and women? This is a very current campaign with a visit question, sorry, with the visibility of the hashtag MeToo campaign or the scandal of the President's Club raging in the press at the moment. But media researchers would ask us ask for some caution and thoughtfulness in terms of how we might respond to these chosen stories, which if we probe deeper reveal the complex and insidious nature of the structural misogyny that marks our culture. A deeper consideration that might be displaced in the knee-jerk reaction of banning women as grid girls or in Formula One or walk on dark girls. We do often recognise the place of the mass media and representations taken organising gendered identities. And an interesting example of this is the controversy over Tinky Winky's handbag. A sign of fashion with feminine attributes, so in this context it was indeed read by some as a negative fashion message as promoting or, and normalising gay sexuality for children, or in a positive way as challenging gender-based stereotypes, opening up different ideas of whom you might want to be as you grow up. Media studies reveals that some of the key cultural signs we employ to signify the essence of girliness or boyness, such as Tinky Winky's handbag, are learnt and historically specific. Indeed, pink, the very sign of cult we, our culture now uses to signify all the qualities of femininity and by which little girls learn to project that femininity, was in the earliest 20th century actually the very colour used to signify natural manliness. The emphasis of media studies as a research-based discipline is then to examine media messages, to unpick pick or rebuild the kind of messages they are offering us as we as they will govern how we treat ourselves and how we treat others will treat us. This is also crucial then and made visible in the media research presented here that we, it is, we never stop learning how to be gendered human beings. From the funny, serious, educational, trivial or even self-made representations we circ see circulated in the vast arena of the modern mass media. Across television, print, film and into the social media networks of today, visual messages continue to create new and reimagine old stereotypes that will both limit or liberate human behaviour. Thus, we would suggest that the tools of media studies um, allow us to better understand the complexities of the current crisis in terms of the behaviour of young men and women, as identified in the more statistical reports on the increase in issues of mental health, bullying and in particular body image. The three research projects in this paper corroborate the power of media messages in fashioning what we might term the modern stereotypes by which young people live out their lives. 
The research findings offer two positives interventions into this debate. Firstly, by identifying the importance of teaching skills in media or visual literacy to young and old alike, allowing society to develop a more critical appreciation of the power of such images. So within the modern space of the internet, we ask for researchers to employ the skills developed in media studies to really address the need for digital literacy and online resilience for our young people. On a more one-to-one -one basis, an understanding of appreciation of how negative behaviours towards others or negative thoughts about ourselves are learnt rather than natural or an individual problem is an incredibly empowering message for young people. It can help young people to see that it's not them as such that has a problem, but rather it is the culture in which we live. So my own research studies my own research studies popular mainstream films watched and enjoyed by young women, the rom-com, the romance, the melodrama, what we loosely called the woman's film. It emerged from some rather antidotal research undertaken over 25 years of teaching gender and feminism in a media studies degree. When students have been asked to describe what, a fem what, a what feminists do and what do they look like. Various stereotypes appeared each year, the suffragette, women fighting equality, the lesbian, the man-hater, ugly women, and so on. In the late 1990s, they began to describe a new stereotype, what I will summarise as the ball-breaking feminist career woman boss. This led me to begin to look back at films and media representations aimed at these young women in an attempt to rebuild where they had learnt to connect feminism with these descriptors. My research began to see that a number of very popular mainstream films in the genre of melodrama and romantic comedies had began in the late 80s to imagine a new kind of feminist woman that was quite different to what was actually a more positive representation in the first film, Kramer vs. Kramer, in, the in 1979. The most infamous, infamous being, of course, Glenn Close in Fatal Attractions. In these films, a new stereotype emerged in which the feminist career woman was constructed in in a very engaging story as heartless, unsisterly, career-orientated, anti-domestic bitch that failed in both love and marriage because she was harsh and unfeminine. In these stories, the narrative and visual representations of both masculinity and femininity suggested to young women that in order to achieve in both career and love, then the old sexualized signs of femininity needed to be restored. We saw this across films such as Pretty Woman and Working Girl where these two representations of femininity, love, career, success, are played out. Finally, creating a culture that now emphasises women's feminised appearance within every walk of life, from yummy mummies to successful entrepreneurs to children's dolls and even down to the shifts in the very, for very young girls with the rebanding of Dora the Explorer. In every part of women's culture, was in every part of women's culture, self-worth, independence, success and action is reimagined through the old definers of femininity. These enjoyable films offered representations that alienated young women from the previous generation of feminist women, while also reinstating an all-encompassing emphasis on women's worth as defined by their, by their sexual appearance. In this respect, my work on film can be linked to the rise of young women's anxiety over appearance and self-worth identified in the, in the reports. Within the context of teaching young women and men, my research identified how such skills of media literacy can empower young people to understand why they feel and behave in certain ways, importantly shifting away from an individual or personal problem to a shared societal and cultural one. This research has been presented at various creative industries training programs in an aim to open up a useful discussion between program makers and researchers. It has also been used within other partnerships such as the very successful and important training initiative Be Seen Be Heard run in partnership with Politics Plus located in this building which aim to not just train more women to increase the role models and voices within news commentary but also offer different types of representations of women visually. Thank you very much. Hi, everybody. Um, I'm just going to continue my on the discussion and talk about some of my own research around reality television. Now, reality television, I'm sure we're all familiar with. It's become the mainstay of our Saturday evening viewing. However, you know, shows such as Gogglebox and Britain's Got Talent and everything, you know, become 
on every screen every every evening on a Saturday night. The programmes I'm talking about, however, are ones that are aimed specifically at teenagers. And I'm thinking about programmes which, which are ones which are very often dismissed by the general public, but also by acad academic study, because it's seen as kind of trash television. However, my argument is that we really need to look at this content that young, young people, that has been aimed at young people, that, but that young people are consuming, and consider what the kind of messages are that they're being sent. So um, I'm sure most people in the room have probably heard of Geordie Shore or Love Island, even if they've ever watched an episode of it. Actually, has people watched an episode of either Geordie Shore or Love Island? Nobody's going to admit to it anyway. Um, the thing about this is Douglas, in 2013, he suggests that most people view this subgenre through the prism of ironic viewing. So those who do watch it, argument shows you demands you simultaneously mock and distance yourself from the cast members, yet the viewer has the hunger to know what on earth they might do next. This is how many adults view such programmes, and by extension they presume that younger viewers will do the same. There is an assumption that young adults are both discerning and media literate, and therefore understand that the scenarios are written, directed, produced and edited in a, ma in a manner similar to a Netflix drama. We understand that this is scripted reality, we understand that this is not real life. However, for the teenagers who are also following these stars on Instagram, Snapchat, who, these people who are using their real names, that ability to distance yourself from the drama that exists within these programmes to the, um, you know, that the fact that this is scripted becomes very dif difficult. That becomes problematic when you think about the reach of these programmes. So in the briefing pack, I've given you some statistics around how viewed and the, view and the, you know, the viewing figures around these, so I'm not going to go into them. But I think when you look at them, you'll see the reach. I think Love Island, actually, which is one, the most popular of this genre that, it, that ran on air last year, it had over 80, 280 million short-form views of their videos online. So to say that these programmes don't have impact and aren't important, I think is very, I think is, is very negligible for our, on our behalf, particularly as a media studies perspective. So the unifying theme in all of this youth-orientated content is drama. However, the, the level of drama that exists within these programmes is completely disproportional. It complete, the overemphasis of drama for a 40-minute programme, which focuses on the fights, the drunken behaviour, as if this is a true reflection of people's lives. Everyone knows that teenagers live dramatic lives. But as I said, the overemphasis on drama is, is particularly imp important. There's an excess on out-of-control behaviour of its participants also, which incite moral outrage from different audiences. But for the teenagers themselves, the message is becoming that this is acceptable behaviour. It's also weighed down with stereotypes that are damaging to both young men and particularly young women. The perfect body, hypersexuality, that sex in, in public is normal, and that men and women can simply not have platonic relationships um, are very important to note. Young women are also presented as untrustworthy worthy, and always rivals in terms of the affections of men, therefore making it impossible to have true female friendships. Female characters are also presented as over-emotional and clingy. Again, these messages that are being constantly reinforced are something that we need to think about and consider. As I said, what is confusing for the viewers is this blurring of the TV programme and the real-life persona of the cast members and their lives. Gervner in 1969 developed a cultivation theory around um, the amount of time people spent living within, with the TV world. And he argued that, that the more likely that people are to, to believe social, the more people they spend time watching TV, the more time they, begin, they believe that the social reality is congruent with TV reality. If you are also spending time what, spend, what, following someone on Snapchat, intera interacting with them on Instagram, buying their clothes on boohoo.com, and buying water bottles that are being marketed to you via ITV, then again, th these reinforcements become very, very important. Some of the main stereotypes around men are around banter, you know, the joke, the laugh, um, the, the hypersexual way in which we talk about women behind their backs, and that women can't be trusted, trusted and are always out for one thing. I think are particularly prevalent when we think about some of the issues that are raised in our media today. Some of the very high profile court cases are going on. We wonder where do young men learn to talk about young women like this. You know, I think we can't ignore these types of media content. So my, the main things we've, I've found is that the, this, these type of programmes, they play a cultural message to viewers that it's appropriate to over sexualise your lifestyle as well have revolved the majority of your life around dating and intimacy. It also signifies that subordination is acceptable for young women and that they promote the embodiment of the media's version of attractive, what's tall, that tall, thin and beautiful. 
again, the research that backs this up as problematic is that research by reachout.ie found that 72% of girls and 69% of boys were stressed out about their body image and that they found that friendship and boy-girl relationships were were something that they struggled with. And 46% found that sending sexual or naked photos or videos is part of their everyday life for teenagers. So this was recent research done to reach out. I don't have time to go into it, but the the normalisation of cosmetic procedures, again, is something that we see around these programmes. And if we look at one of the cast members of Geordie Shore there, Chloe, we see this is when she started the show, and this is one of her most recent pictures. The normalisation that people would transfer their their lives and their appearance through what's deemed non-cosmetic uh, or non-surgical cosmetic procedures, again, be, is something that we need to stop, talk about and consider. So as I said, unfortunately, I have a very brief period of time to go into this, and I'm happy to talk to people later. But um, I think it's just important to think about some of the messages that we've been talking about. Again, as we've said, this research is, is, is ongoing, and I'm doing f- some follow-up work with teenagers, but also doing work with some media production companies and media commissioners around thinking about the kind of messages, because it is really, really important to remember that this is scripted. So while we're presented and talked about reality TV, there's there's nothing realistic about it. Thank you. Um, I'm just going to finish up um, uh, following on from my colleagues. Um, I want to present some research findings related to uh, media literacy, which is essentially what we're talking about here within these presentations. But I'm looking to a media literacy that is framed by how social media tools can offer positive opportunities for young people to create messages that enhance their understanding of their own, um, their own beings. My research essentially um, investigates the selfie, the photograph of the self that is captured and circulated through social media networks, but importantly, an image that is understood to operate as a sign that communicates us to others. I came to this research, the Selfie Reflective Project, primarily in an attempt to understand how how my students were engaged with their learning. Student engagement is seen as one of the indicators on which the quality of teaching provision in higher education is measured. And therefore, as instructors, we carry out various surveys to elicit information about how the behaviours of our students impact on their learning. The key challenge here is that students often lack the critical reflective skills that enable them to recount authentic experiences of their learning and report them back. For a student to reflect appropriately and authentically on their learning, they need to have skills in relation to self-awareness, critical analysis, synthesis, um, and with, um, without these skills, students are unable to identify that which learning experience worked well for them. They are unable to convert experiences of their learning into useful verbal propositions, and they're unable to produce adequate accounts of their past behaviours in relation to their learning. So what can the selfie lend to that skills gap? Well, my project really leans on prior media research in respect of analogue and digital photography. In terms of analogue, since the very origins of the photograph as a visual medium, it has been acknowledged that photographs that document our lives have the ability to reveal really important insights into the self. By reflecting on images captured in family albums, framed on the mantelpiece, or tucked deep into wallets, The photograph has become an important, tangible memento that contributes to notions of how we remember and know ourselves. In the digital era, we we are required to perform acts of classification on the photograph for the purposes of its distribution and communication. Therefore, the selfie posted to Instagram is adorned with filters, annotated with hashtags, emoji and textual descriptions. Therefore, while in the realm of the analogue image, we may have applied memory and recall in the reading of the photograph, in the digital, where the image of the self is posted and circulated through social networks, these facts of memory and recall become more deliberate and made visual. Thus, the selfie I am uh, uh, positioning um, creates a process of self-reflection that has become intensified. So what happened when my students captured selfies of themselves in the classroom and posted these images to Instagram? What did the analysis of this reflective act 
that they performed on the image of themselves reveal about how the student is engaged with their learning? Well, it was all good. My students in general have a very clear understanding of what is expected of them. They seek to deliver work on time and of a high standard, have an ambition to succeed on their course of study, and they dem demonstrate a, queer, a clear willingness <coughs> to take personal responsibility from their work. And I reached that conclusion by performing a range of analysis, both visual and textual, looking at the metadata that was attached to these images. So what the institution, what the academy needs to know when it comes to reporting on student engagement, those are the key indicators there. But what I found most interesting was how the students are performing these messages using the selfie. And looking at some of the visual aspects, there were some really remarkable selfies that were composed using a close framing of the face and most prevalently used when the student is communicating an anxiety. And that anxiety becomes an intimate and personal disclosure of their deep fears and insecurities about their learning. There was the framing of the student to include the classroom behind them. And that photograph and the annotated message became a really useful document that told me about that student's sense of belonging within the classroom and working amongst their peers. And with, within a large number of these acts of um, uh, reflection, something that we call the uh, taxonomy of control is evident. And what I mean by that is where the student reports an anxiety connected to their learning, the student then proposes actions that will create new conditions upon which they will be able to succeed. Where the anxieties are reported but not su subject to this taxonomy of control, a sense of hopelessness is inferred. And there are significant, significant engendered nuances to draw from this information, with the female students being more likely to exercise this control value. And importantly, the significant emotional indicator for how they perceive their learning is negative, with these, some of the most commonly used words, phrases, and hash hashtags attached to the, to, the, to the selfie. And furthermore, more interestingly, while careers teachers and parents continually prompt students to take subjects that they enjoy, descriptions of enjoyment of the subject are very much obvious by their absence in any of the messages that were communicated alongside these selfies. So we need to think about that. So what can be achieved by using the self as a form of reflective practice? The, my study shows very clear evidence that there is thoughtful, in, thoughtful introspection performed by the student upon their image of the self and therefore gives me an important tool to understand how they are engaged with their learning. I think what is also important um, using the selfie within these instances is the message becomes very connected to how the students feel. It is not in relation to what they are doing. It is the emotions that they are feeling. And I would make the point that to cope with anxiety, anxiety has to be recognised, it has to be acknowledged, and it has to be articulated before any intervention can be applied. And I think that was very clearly evident in a lot of the... Um, aspects of the messages coming forward. So really I just want to finish off here today that um, the media provides us <coughs> with um, a range of messages and indicators that are informing our young people, informing their lives and the way in which they live their lives. And essentially we're positioning that essentially a media literacy needs to be framed by this in order to understand the messages that young people are receiving from these mediums and how they're using these, these mediums to express themselves clearly underline that there needs to be very strong th theoretical underpinnings coming from that media studies perspective. Thank you.